You're with Libby Gore on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774. Good morning. Today is Saturday the 14th of November. How has the year come to this? Well, be that as it may, no matter how we got there, because I'm still kind of in shock as you possibly are, I thought this morning we would get back to business. Particularly given it's November. I'm waving my dick in the wind. talking about prostates. Prostates, penises and sexual function. Yes, we're back into it here on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria because prostate cancer is just as prevalent in men as breast cancer is in women and we shouldn't need it to be Movember but it is Movember. Men's Health Month. If you have suffered from prostate cancer or you're living with it. My understanding is it's a condition that generally you live with and something else takes you out. Do give us a call as to how you've managed it. You know, how you've got yourself back on track, how you've made things work again. one three hundred triple two seven seven four. But we will be talking about prostate cancer and the management of such a little bit later with Professor Declan Murphy. Did I say it was Sunday the... What did I say? Sunday the 14th? No. It's Sunday the 15th. It's Sunday the 15th of November. But, you know, I was just testing you to make sure that you could text me and tell me what day it was. I can tell you that it's uh, eight and a half minutes past ten, so I know the time. It's just the date. Nadia is taking full responsibility for writing the wrong thing on the screen. We're a team. We've got two pairs of hands. Let's just start with something a little closer to home. In fact, it might live at the heart of your relationship, not just with someone else, but with yourself. We're talking about prostate cancer. We're talking with one of the best in the business, Professor Declan Murphy, and one person in particular I'm very excited to introduce you to is Bruce Wally. And we're also going to get your stories because I reckon, just like breast cancer with women, it's more common than one would think. Perfect for us to talk about this Sunday, 15th of November. It's 14 minutes past 10. Good morning. One person in particular I'm very excited to introduce you to his name is Bruce Wally. He is a Melbourne tram driver. And he learned he had prostate cancer when he was being treated following a motorcycle accident. Something completely unrelated. Good morning to you, Good Bruce. Good morning. Good morning, Libby Gore. <laughs> we finally get to talk. Absolutely. What happened? Uh, what happened, well, Bruce? Well, m my life was very, very normal. You know, married a uh, hundred years uh, to the most gorgeous woman in the world, and uh, two teenage children finishing their uh, school studies. I was fit. I was swimming. I could outrun, out sprint them, and I was over at my friend's place, uh, putting a uh, helping him put a gearbox in his Harley Davidson. Coming home, had a motorcycle accident. Uh, got scraped off the road, and while I was in hospital getting my uh, my knee put back together, the doctor came around and said, um, we'll do some blood tests and we'll do this and we'll do that and uh, PSA. They don't have to do PSA because I've just had it done two months ago. And my GP says it's under five, we don't have to worry about it, you've got no symptoms, you don't have to worry about it, and it's all good. He said, oh, I've ticked it anyway, we'll just, we'll just let it go. And from there... Um, I found out that, uh, in fact, uh, I, I had a, I, he convinced me to get a biopsy done, uh, and uh, I um, found out I had the most aggressive form of prostate cancer that you can possibly have, and I would have been dead within six months. I would have seen my daughter's 21st birthday, and that was it, all how, over Red Rover. How crazy. I wonder how it could have been missed with just regular checks. Um, well, the level of knowledge of, P of uh, prostate cancer out there in the wide world is uh, very patchy, very patchy, and that's something that I am passionate about. That's why I'm an ambassador for Movember, and I preach prostate cancer awareness every chance I get. Can you tell me, Bruce, I know that you're very chatty because you're on the tram line, right? I might have heard you chatting on the tram. I might have heard you listening, Libby. <laughs> 
I always listen when my tram driver talks. Once, you know, I was crossing the road when I shouldn't and the tram driver actually yelled at me through the mi- through the microphone onto the road. I got the fright of my life. Anyway, that's... He would have encouraged you. He would have encouraged you. It would have been out of love, Libby, out of love. She was very cross. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to know, Bruce, the treatment. Did you have radiation? Did you have surgery? Did you have the whole deal? Uh... I, I was not able to get the uh, the low level, the brachytherapies and that sort of stuff because of uh, where the cancer was and the and and the, the the progression that it was. It was fortunately still inside my prostate. Um, so my wife and I went and interviewed three um, treatment services. We did it in one day because we had like a death. They said, look, you've got to get all this done within two weeks. Otherwise, we can't guarantee you're going to be having a long life at all. So we interviewed uh, a traditional surgeon. We interviewed a radiation uh, surgeon and we interviewed a uh, a, uh, um, micro surgery, robotic surgery. Yep. And uh, weighed up all of the pros and cons. And I can tell you... No surgeon says, thank you for coming. Um, you know, I'm the 20th best surgeon for treating this uh, condition that you've got in Melbourne. There's other people better than me, but I really appreciate you coming to me. I'll look after you the best I can. No one says that. It's really, really difficult to go and discern what's the best treatment for you. Right, and that's what you have to do. And so many men are frightened because they think there will be lasting effects on their sex life and their erectile function. Can you can you work around that post surgery, post treatment? Um, well, look, that was one of the things that we considered in the sort of outcomes uh, and the type of surgery approach that we selected, which was robotic surgery. In the end, I am very, very grateful that uh, my surgeon um, did an amazing job and I still have erectile function and I still have bladder control. But I can tell you that the uh, the carnage out there um, uh, from um, various forms of surgery, um, you know, it can affect your radiation, can affect your, your bowel. There's, there's lots of things you've got to take into account and it's it's no fault of anyone. It's just what happens. It's just what happens. But, but it does have but, a... It does have an impact on your mental health as well as your physical health. Ab- absolutely, and uh, like I said, two mates of mine. They're, for one of them, his marriage broke up afterwards. You know, they're wearing continence pads and that sort of stuff. It's it's really, really. Uh, it's not just prostate cancer. It's something that you've got to carry with you um, with a badge um, for the rest of your life, and you've got to live. And it's not easy. Are you driving a tram this morning, Bruce? I will be today. Yes. Are you going to tell everybody on the tram that we had a chat? It's Movember. I tell people that we're singing Christmas carols in December. I tell people that we need to get a smile because we haven't had much to smile about. I tell people about Movember, prostate cancer, testicular cancer. Check them out. Do it yourself or uh, get someone to do it for you. Um, And mental health, you need to be on top of that as well. So everyone gets a whole enchilada. I'm I'm glad, Bruce. I, I I am incredibly excited for the lucky people who jump on your tram today. Are, are actually more Melburnians jumping on trams? Is it becoming there more? Are, they, they are starting to come back with me, oh, yes, and that is a good thing. I've got an audience at last. Oh, Bruce. Well, you've been fabulous this morning. I do need my regular tram correspondent, so I hope you'll stay with me. Absolutely. Bruce Wally, Melbourne tram driver, Monty had prostate cancer and... Not only has lived to tell the tale, but <clears throat> has embraced the whole caboodle to become an ambassador. I'm going to introduce you now to one of the doctors who... Oopsie, beg your pardon. One of the doctors who has made a huge difference in this area. His name is Professor Declan Murphy. Listen, let me invite you, if you would like to tell your story of prostate cancer, that if you've had it, if you've survived it, if you're dealing with it at the moment... Please feel free to call 1300 222 774 because <clears throat> I have noticed that the more people talk about it and show up and say, actually, I'm dealing with this, the less frightening it might be for someone who for them is a secret and they think their secret is going to overwhelm them and they can't actually cope. They hear other people talking about it and they think, you know what, maybe tomorrow I can go and get this looked at. 1300 222 774 is the number. Professor Declan Murphy joins you now. He's the consultant urologist and director of genitourinary oncology at the Peter McCallum Clinic. Good morning to you, Declan. Good morning, Libby. Oh, you're a good man getting up on a Sunday and sharing all this knowledge. 
Of course, it was worth getting up just to listen to Bruce. What a great uh, ambassador he is. Yeah, well, isn't that interesting, though? He felt like he'd had all the tests and that he was in a good space, and then a random thorough checkup revealed that he wasn't. And unfortunately, that can be uh, that can be the way. Sometimes you just need a little bit of good luck coming out a bit of bad luck, as he had with his accident uh, that leads to this. It can be quite accidental sometimes that people uh, make that decision or accidentally stumble up upon a, a test that actually was very important, as it turns out in Bruce's case. Can you tell me, Declan, the role of the prostate and why does it get cancer? So the main role of the prostate is, is, was really in the early part of lives because it's uh, really the organ of reproduction or the, order, the organ of ejaculation, uh, Libby. Uh, that's what it's there for. It facilitates ejaculation. Um, and once we get older um, and that is deemed to be less important, uh, then it tends to develop some uh, medical conditions. And the two things that it tends to do as we get older is either get uh, cancerous uh, or it just gets enlarged uh, and starts interfering with the, the way we uh, pass our, our water and so on. But in early years, it tends to not have those conditions because it's, it's, it's working well. Its main role is for reproduction. But in later years, uh, and I, I don't think we were meant to live into our 60s and 70s and 80s when these things tend to happen, but it does develop either cancer or just overgrowth, causing some symptoms. So does it cause the actual function of pushing out the sperm or does it make the sperm? Like, is it the ejaculation gland or does it actually create the sperm? I, I kind of describe it as being like the gearbox uh, of all this uh, Libby because uh, the sperm actually come out of the testicles so that they're, you know, a little bit away from where the prostate are. And most of the fluid that is ejaculated comes out of the, the seminal vesicles. These are a couple of glands that live nearby the prostate. And then they co th that all comes together in the prostate, in the gearbox, if you like. You've got the, the sperm coming up from the testicles and the ejaculatory fluid coming out from the vesicles and then the, the prostate facilitates. It's uh, the ejaculation. So is it true that I, I have heard of, of some deaths through prostate cancer, but my understanding is that if caught early enough, many just manage it and live with it as distinct from it being a fatal condition. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and you often hear the phrase that it's a condition that people often die with rather than die of. And, and that is certainly true because as, as we get older, it actually becomes quite a common diagnosis if you go digging around for it. But lots of men really don't need to have it discovered or have it treated because it will sit there in many cases for many years. However, um, it, it is certainly an Ooh, understatement. Who's that? Hang on, just stand by. Oh, some... It must be me, is it? That was me. I beg your pardon. Please continue, Declan. Yeah, but, but I, I also think that, that we have to be careful with that statement because it can be uh, it can underestimate the significance of this cancer. And even in Australia, where we do tend to pick it up very early, uh, by and large, over the past 20 or 30 years, we still have 50 or 60 men every week dying of prostate cancer. So it, it's still a very big killer. Uh, but thankfully, if it's picked up early, it means that people have a very high chance of uh, avoiding death from prostate cancer. Uh, in fact, if you pick it up early enough, we, we usually avoid treatment. You know, many of these newly diagnosed prostate cancers don't even need treatment and we don't need to uh, go down the pathway of surgery or radiation treatment and so on, uh, provided you pick things up very early. Why don't they need treatment? Well, it's, and it's back to that comment that a lot of people will die with this cancer rather than die of it because it, it really is not just one thing uh, when you hear the term prostate cancer. I, I often describe it as being like a very broad spectrum and right down one end of the spectrum is something that is barely cancer at all. Yes, it, it does meet the criteria to be called cancer, but it tends not to behave like we usually imagine cancer, something that's going to spread and move off to different parts of the body and, and maybe lead to death and so on. On. So that's right down one end of the spectrum. And if you identify those cancers in those men, um, and we now know how to recognize those, then we'll say, you don't need treatment, you can have surveillance. We're just going to keep an eye on this condition. And in some of those men, a minority of those men, the plan will change over the years uh, because we recognize the cancer is changing to be a little bit more aggressive and you can treat it. Whereas up the other end of the spectrum, you know, we have cancer that is prostate cancer that is very dangerous. And that sounds like what Bruce had, mm. you know, picked up early, but it has features that mean we know if you don't treat that or indeed if you never found it in the first place, it's going to cause problems. It's going to be one of those ones that will lead to, you know, premature death. So it's very important when we 
uh, identify a prostate cancer. And indeed, when we speak to patients about that whole process of having a test and so on, we reassure them that it may well be they get picked up with a cancer that we will say to them, look, this is not dangerous, we can just keep an eye on this. Is it generally associated with bladder cancer? What's the relationship? No. No. Yeah, no, not really. Uh, they, they are in the same neighbourhood. They're attached to each other, uh, of course, but the cancers are different. They're different. Uh, and prostate cancer is way more common than bladder cancer. Malcolm's called in. Hi, Malcolm. Oh, hi, how are you going? Good. Did you want to join the conversation with Declan? I can, yes. Yeah. So I, um, my PSA went from about one and a half to five, and then um, he, he suggested I get an MRI, my specialist. So I got an MRI, and it didn't, it didn't show anything. Uh, and then I went back and seen him and with another PSA test and it had gone to nearly nine. <sighs> so he suggested I get a biopsy. I had a biopsy. Um, I'm very fortunate. And um, it's, it's low-grade cancer. It's, it's category is low-grade cancer. And it's a Gleason score. I asked the question because I looked at it around. They, they have this Gleason score. And it's a Gleason score six. And um, the recommendation although I've been told by many people to get a second opinion, the recommendation is to monitor it, watch it. So I went back and seen my specialist and asked him all more questions about it. And basically, he's going to monitor it, uh, monitor it by having a PSA test done roughly every three months. And he feels my prostate and sees that it's not in... Uh, not getting enlarged. It was it was enlarged, but it has gone down. Um, and strangely, I had another test just recently done, and my PSA had gone from nine back to back to three and a half, and my prostate was back to normal size. So, had uh, you taken treatment to make that happen, Malcolm? No, no. Well, no. hang on a minute. Let me just ask Declan how that happens. That that sounds a bit random, Declan. Uh, good morning, Malcolm. And you know what? It's not random. This is actually very typical behaviour. But, but I think Ma- I love Malcolm's story because this is a story of success for us. Uh, first of all, he's a fellow who was having his PSA checked. That's the, the blood test that we like people to, to get done when they you know reach 50 or thereabouts and upwards. And it went from lowish up to highish, which raised a little bit of concern. Rather than, than going straight for a biopsy, he, uh, his specialist sent him for an MRI scan. And these are now you know, fully rebated in Australia. We have really a very um, great support from federal government to get these scans reimbursed. And if the scan is normal, as it was in his case, he didn't have a biopsy. So that's a, a, good, a good thing. People don't like thinking, oh, I'm going to have a biopsy. Yet when the suspicion raised a bit further with the blood test going up, he did have a biopsy. So I, I think that's a very good journey. It wasn't that he went straight to a biopsy. He had a, a very fancy test done. And lo and behold, he had a little bit of low-grade cancer. That's exactly what I was referring to a a moment ago, Libby, the sort of thing we would keep an eye on. But I get the slight anxiety in Malcolm's voice that Mm. he's been told, you've got prostate cancer, um, your blood test has gone up, but you don't need treatment. And and we understand this is a stressful uh, proposition to say to somebody, you've got cancer, but we can keep an eye on it. Um, And in fact, we we set up a trial um, a couple of years ago, which is still running, very suitable for people like Malcolm, um, called the Navigate study, uh, and people can find it if they just Google Navigate study uh, Peter Mac, um, and you'll come to a website. And this is for newly diagnosed within three months, uh, low-grade cancer, and you get offered a, a decision aid, an online decision aid, uh, to help inform you better. And we, we got the, the, the million-dollar funding for that trial uh, because we know it can be stressful for people to be told you can go on surveillance. So the, 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 the tool is designed to try and support people's decision so they feel comfortable and confident, as they should do, being told, you don't need treatment. Mm. Indeed, the side effects going on with it, we can just keep an eye on this. You know, it's really interesting. Um, the number is one three hundred triple two seven seven four. This is such an important conversation, and I know you want to talk about it because I'm inundated with texts. The phone line is gingerly lighting up. I know that you possibly have prostate cancer in your world, whether it be you, whether it you be your husband uh, or just you, you know, and feel like it's this big secret. It's no big secret. It's out there. It is just one of those things that happens in this life that we lead. And so this weekend life, this Sunday, the 15th of November, we're taking your calls on one 
22774. I'm going to ask the big question that is coming through on text message, and when I say coming through, no pun intended. The role of ejaculation in keeping the prostate healthy. Uh, yeah, the role of ejaculation in keeping the prostate healthy. Is masturbation a good exercise to keep the prostate healthy if you're not having regular sex? That seems to be a recurrent question from our listeners. Declan. Yes, Libby, this is a great Sunday morning fair, isn't yep, it? Yep, I, I just I, asked it. And I thank you for having this topic on. It really is so important, especially in November when we're trying to raise awareness and especially when we know COVID has affected um, uh, the, the behaviours of people getting checkups. And maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that. But yes, it is, is the answer. As I said at the, at the outset, the prostate is supposed to be the organ of ejaculation. That's what it does. And so it's a healthy thing for the prostate to ejaculate. And in fact, there was a study done uh, at Harvard University a couple of years ago uh, where they looked at um, uh, whether e regular ejaculation was a beneficial thing in terms of uh, pre preventing or reducing the risk of prostate cancer. And, and this study showed that in, in younger, healthier men, uh, if they were in the habit of regular ejaculation, as they tend to be, it did reduce the risk, you know, 20, 30 years later that they would develop prostate cancer. Um, and there's a magic number. There's a number of ejaculations uh, per month, actually, that this study from Harvard oh. identified. Well, all Everybody's and going to get their pen and paper and write it down. Correct. Get, where's the drum roll? And, I'll and get the, it for the, you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 21 times a month. That's, 21 that's the answer. Times yeah, at what yeah. age? Uh, well, it was in, I think it was up to about 30 or 35 years of age, oh, you know, gosh. regular ejection. And look, you know, these studies, they give some guidance and some hints. What but happens I think over 45, between 45 and 65? They're, the, they're my listeners here. Yes. Well, look, I, I think I'll go back and say what we said at the start. You know, regular ejaculation is a, is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. And, okay. uh, and there you go. Okay. And it, and it doesn't matter whether or not how you ejaculate, whether you do it yourself or whether you do it with someone else. It's just the process of ejaculation. Yes, and it's not rare for me to be sitting in the consulting rooms with a, a couple in front of me, and they ask that same question, and then uh, Johnny will turn towards Mary and say, there you go, and I'll turn it back to Johnny and say, you know, you, this can be a one-man show, Johnny, as long as you ejaculate, uh, that's a good thing. It's 25 minutes to 11 o'clock. I thought that was a good moment to take a time call. Stan is in Euroa. Good morning, Stan. Good morning, Jay. Um I'm Libby. Libby. Yep. Yes. Um, yes, I had uh, prostate cancer in 2005, but fortunately, I was probably lucky in a way because I was fairly old. I was 72, and it was low grade. Are you in your 90s now, Stan? I'm, I'm, I'm 87 now. 87? Good on you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, they, they diagnosed it with the PSA readings, and then they thought I might have had it a, a little bit, so they sent me and I had a, bi I had a biopsy, and that, that, that proved it. So then they treated me with hormone therapy. They were, they were a capsule they put into your stomach. And I had that for about three months. That was to lower your uh, hormones, your, your male hormones. So then, anyhow, then they took me down to, to Peter McCallum and I was treated with what's called brachytherapy. And, and at that stage, it was pretty, pretty new. I think it, was, oh, it might have been a bit of a new, new guinea pig stage at that stage. Yeah. So anyhow, yeah, and it's been very successful, but I've had uh, three operations on my um, urethra since. Ah. And I've got to the stage now where I, I have to wear pads all the time. But that must but, be a pain, uh, but you're here, uh, right? Oh, it's not too bad. It's not, not too, too bad. bad. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, I, I'm not, it's not much, but the, the surgeon did warn me last time. She said, we can't go any closer to the uh, your, out, your, your outlet valve. Otherwise, she said, we'll ruin the valve. Well, there you go, Stan. That's a good story, is it not, Declan? Well, lovely to hear Stan uh, listening on a Sunday morning and ringing in to share his experience. Um, like with Bruce, you know, uh, Libby, it's so important for listeners that they hear not from specialists, uh, people like me or nurses, uh, but they hear from other blokes because the messages are much better received when we hear Stan and we hear Malcolm and um, Bruce and so on. Um, but yes, uh, you know, the, the important message there is, you know, if you have treatment for your prostate cancer, whether it's radiation or surgery, fancy surgery, fancy radiation, uh, 
there are always going to be at least some short-term side effects because of where the prostate is, you know, right down there in the urinary tract and in the sexual function uh, mechanisms. Um, and some of these will be longer-term side effects. Um, but, you know, like all things, I suppose, modern technology, modern radiation, modern surgery, Use these side effects, uh, but not to zero. Not to and, zero. And it's lovely to, it's not to zero. And it's lovely to hear well, uh, Stan seems um, happy to, to be here and so on. But uh, um, uh, uh, if, he's, um, uh, if he's prepared to share that message, it's still very important. Steve is one of your patients, actually. He said he had surgery early this year. He wants to talk about the post surgery recovery. Steve, good morning to you. Oh, hi, Libby, and hi, Declan. I'm not sure if you remember me. Declan, you operated on me in February this year, end of February. Hello, Steve. Yes. <laughs> I was listening. I just had to listen to the radio and I thought, uh, you know, I'd listen along and if people are ringing in, I thought I could provide some, post, you know, some of my story, I suppose. I'd love to hear some of your post-surgery recovery. So what actual procedure did you have and how did that affect you? And then how are you now? Yep. yep. Um, so I had the robotic surgery. Um, so when I, when I was uh, speaking with Declan, and, um, uh, and I'd, I'd been diagnosed more than a year ago and... Um, I'd been on the, just the monitoring program for a year, but after a year, my the cancer had progressed from low grade to you know, grade one to grade two, and, and uh, Declan's um, recommendation was for surgery, and I went to see a radiation uh, specialist, and his recommendation was for surgery as well, so it sort of made it easier for me to you know choose uh, surgery as an option. Um, the surgery went well, like it's a long it's a long a long session to remove the the prostate with the robotic surgery, but. At the end of that day, basically, you know, the cancer was gone in my case, um, and and that and that's, you know, I guess what the, the number one important thing is is to get rid of the cancer, I suppose. But how did and it me, how did it affect your bladder? How did it affect your uh, sexual yeah, function? Well, well, bladder. I mean, it's nine almost nine months now, and my bladder operation is probably almost back to normal. I'd say, you know, it's, it's pretty good. I don't I don't wear pads anymore, but I still have to be careful with what I do, and you know, keep up my pelvic floor exercises and things. Um, Sexual function is, is nothing like it was before, so, you know, that's, you know, an ongoing thing that I don't know whether that will ever improve, but, uh, you know, I think... There are people that to... help with that as well, though, don't they? I mean, there are lots of ways are, you can have sex. It doesn't yeah, have to yeah. be that traditional way. No, no, and, and Declan, Declan has, you know, recommends ways and things, but it's really, I guess, up to yourself and your partner and, and how you choose to, you know, to follow up with those, with those treatments and things. So, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, the main thing for me was getting rid of the cancer and, and recovering... From the from the incontinence and, and and then you know see what happens after that. Declan, lovely to hear, Steve. You know you've got that nervous moment of a patient coming on the radio, and I'm hoping <laughs> he's done very well, and he will be too. Uh, so he won't put other men off. But lovely to yeah. hear you, Steve. Um, and yes, I think we kept an eye on his cancer for a while on the surveillance program, and yep. and, um, and and then it had changed, so we opted to jump in. Um, and look, he, he makes a few really important points there. It's great to hear the consonants is back to normal, but, uh, you know, it's not surprising nine months out from surgery, uh, uh, even if it was, you know, nerve sparing surgery and so on, to have difficulty with the erections. And, and this is really, for us nowadays, the most predictable um, problem uh, after surgery. Uh, for prostate cancer, you know, by and large, we tend to get the cancer, get a great result from the cancer with the, the tumor, the prostate out. We tend to get a great result with continence uh, in most the vast majority of circumstances, but there can be a few months of, of leakage and so on, but most people get rid of it. However, uh, sexual function tends to be the, the main casualty here, at least in the short term. Uh, and for many men, it can be a long-term issue. And I suppose two points I'd make about that is, first, that's why we like doing surveillance. That, that's why we like saying to men nowadays, look, you, you can just watch your cancer, and then we don't need to worry about any of these side effects. Um, and the second point I'll make is, because it's so predictable, we tend to want to counsel men well beforehand about this issue and about the likely couple of years while we wait to see what uh, recovery might be there and also the measures we might put in place to support people um, in terms of you know uh, drugs that we use like viagra or uh, pumps or using the the expertise of our uh, nurses and uh, intimacy experts and there's a website that um, we refer patients to called a touchy subject.com uh, <laughs> great title and it's yeah. run by 
one of our intimacy specialists, uh, Victoria Cullen. And that, that website that anyone uh, can go and have a look at has lots of free resource for people and lots of, you know, videos that she posts every week, which get hundreds of thousands of views from around the world, uh, d dealing with the very practical matters of uh, recovering erectile function or managing erectile dysfunction uh, with, with all sorts of tricks, pumps, injections, and so on. Uh, and so I, I always recommend um, pa patients that we look, uh, who we look after ourselves or who come to us for second opinion opinions subsequently to have a look at a touchy subject.com. I love that. Now, we do need to get this message out to the CALD community. How do we do that, Declan Murphy? How do we make sure that all of the men in our community, regardless of their ability to speak the language, understand that we have fabulous surveillance in this country, a beautiful health system from which we all benefit? How do we spread the word? Uh, there are two matters. I mean, the second matter is, is about um, getting second opinions. I think that's very important. And, and uh, we say that to all the, the patients who come to us for a second opinion, that it doesn't mean you're, you're changing the team or even changing the plan. It just means you're going to be better informed. Mm -hmm. And that, that theme about being well informed about the decisions you make is so important um, so that you don't look back, you know, years later with your regret to say, well, I never knew about radiation or I never knew I could have had robot surgery uh, and so on. Um, so don't, don't live with regret. Be well informed. And, and making your mind up with a newly diagnosed prostate cancer is never an emergency. Um, there's always time to, to get that second opinion or go to a PCFA support group and so on. Uh, but the first message really is something that really concerns us, Libby, um, nowadays. And of course, COVID has dominated all our lives for all these you know, important reasons um, uh, for the past nine months. But we have very worryingly um, seen a, a drop in very many new cancer diagnoses uh, this year. Uh, and Cancer Australia published a report this week, which Movember have also issued uh, their own opinion on, showing that prostate cancer is one of those cancers that's taken a huge hit during COVID. Yeah. And to give you some idea, you know, um, the data published this week shows that over the a period between March and June across Australia, there was a drop of between 25 and 40% um, in prostate cancer diagnoses. Oh, um, Declan, we're, we're going to fix that this week. Yeah, All well, the men so. in Victoria uh, will be yeah. making an appointment to go and have their PSA levels checked because we've reminded them and you've done it beautifully. Yeah, and look, there's been reasons why it's been you know, not the most important thing for the last few months. It was important to stay at home and look after yourself and so on. But because of the extended lockdown in Victoria, uh, we estimate within the, the COVID Cancer Network Task Force that I, I chair, the Prostate Cancer Group, we estimate this year there'll be more than a 1,000 men over the past nine months in Victoria, listeners to your program, who would have been diagnosed yep. with prostate cancer, who have not been, more than a 1,000 men out there in Victoria. So we do need to, to catch up so that those men don't end up coming in with very advanced cancer. And I hope as that I say, you'll be yeah, able it, to it, cope with the onslaught, Declan, because everyone will yeah. be ringing tomorrow. That's our purpose on this program. It's to make tomorrow better than it was today. And I can't thank you enough for joining us this morning. Well, thank you very much, Libby. Professor Declan Murphy, Consultant Urologist and Director of the Genito-Urinary Oncology Unit at Peter McCallum. I say it once again, if you haven't been checked, if you're you know over 45 and 50 and you haven't had your prostate checked, you need to make an appointment this week because the numbers are low, it's fallen off during COVID, but you need to sort yourself out before summer really kicks in. It's not too late also to sign up for Movember or to donate to the Men's Health uh, Push. Movember.com is the website. And we are really pleased to be able to remind you, blokes and women, to get your blokes onto it, whether they be your husband, father, sons, uncles need to go this week and sort it out.